Hello everyone, my name is Foreas, and welcome to my channel. For those of you in Australia, we have a referendum coming up in roughly October 2023. It's possible you didn't even know this was the case. So you must be asking yourself, Foreas, uh, what is the referendum about? What do I need to know? Look, I'm not a seasoned activist, a parliamentarian with the gift of the gab, or a constitutional lawyer, but I have done some research into the voice to parliament, and today's video essay will go over my two cents on the topic. If you were to ask me for an elevator pitch, it'll be this. This voice to parliament is an advisory committee to speak to the concerns of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander mobs around Australia. We, as Australians, believe in a fair go for all, and we are being asked by the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people to establish a framework to recognise their concerns in the Australian political landscape. If you're new here, this is a series of video essays where I cover political, economic, and revolutionary topics which are relevant to our time. I read the books, so you don't have to. So consider subscribing for more content in the future. With that, let's jump right in. So let's cover the basics. What's a constitution anyway? If we look up Old Man Google, we find that the Constitution is a founding document that sets out how a country is to be governed. The Constitution has a special status as it overrides any other laws and can't be changed by the Parliament of the day. That last part of the quote is really important to the topic, but we'll return to that later. How about I use an example to showcase what I'm talking about? Let's take the House of Representatives, that is the Australian Lower House in Canberra. The House of Representatives shall be composed of members directly chosen by the people of the Commonwealth, and the number of such members shall be, as nearly as practicable, twice the number of the Senators. The number of members chosen in these several states shall be in proportion to the respective numbers of their people, and shall, until the Parliament otherwise provides, be determined, whenever necessary, in the following manner. 1. A quota shall be ascertained by dividing the number of people of the Commonwealth as shown by the latest statistics of the Commonwealth, by twice the number of the Senators. 2. The number of members to be chosen in each state shall be determined by dividing the number of the people of the state, as shown by the latest statistics of the Commonwealth, by the quota. And if one such division, there is a remainder greater than one half of the quota. One more member shall be chosen in the state. A little confused? Don't worry, it's to prove a point which we'll come to. As you can see in the quote before, the Constitution is about the framework of how political institutions function in Australian society. It is that the executive exists. That is the Prime Minister and the Cabinet. It is that the House of Representatives exists. And this is where we come back to how the changing of the Constitution is quite difficult thanks to the concept of double majority. The reason why referendums are so difficult to pass is that they require not only a majority of voters across the nation voting yes, but also a majority of yes votes in a majority of states. In other words, more than 50% of voters in four of the six states have to vote yes, as well as the nation as a whole. The votes of citizens in the two territories, the ACT and the Northern Territory, count towards the national, national tally, but the territories are not counted in determining the majority of states. The Constitution is separate to say legislation that goes through the House of Representatives and the Senate. It has to be put to the Australian people as to whether we want to add to Australia's foundational document since Federation in 1901. 
Now, I'm sure the legal studies students in the audience are impatiently waiting for me to get to the point. What started the voice to parliament? Well, it boils down to six words. The Uluru Statement of the Heart. The statement was the culmination of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander elders and delegates coming together and deciding on how to shape their future. Thomas Mayo described this process as dialogues. The dialogues sprang from a 16-member referendum council backed in the spirit of bipartisanship by Prime Minister Malcolm Turnbull and opposition leader Bill Shorten formed in December 2015 to advise the government on a pathway to constitutional recognition. The Uluru Dialogues were regional covering the entire continent and adjacent islands and the lands of all Indigenous First Nations. They were designed and led by First Nations experts and local leaders with a commitment to achieving inclusion. The participants were invited in accordance with a formula that ensured representation for gender balance, stolen generations, youth and First Nations people of country. Also, traditional owners from each region were strongly represented. It is here in 2017 where the calls for recognition and the voice to parliament committee were first agreed upon in the dialogues amongst the elders and the leaders of the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities, the Uluru Statement was forged. We seek constitutional reforms to empower our people and take a rightful place in our own country. When we have power over our destiny, our children will flourish. They will walk in two worlds and their culture will be a gift to their country. We call for the establishment of a First Nations voice enshrined in the Constitution. Makarada is the culmination of our agenda, the coming together after a struggle. It captures our aspirations for a fair and truthful relationship with the people of Australia and a better future for our children based on justice and self-determination. We seek a Makarata Commission to supervise a process of agreement making between governments and First Nations and truth-telling about our history. In 1967, we were counted... In 2017, we seek to be heard. We leave base camp and start our trek across this vast country. We invite you to walk with us in a movement of Australian people for a better future. This is probably where you've heard the words voice, treaty and truth come from. Now, I know the history lesson was a bit of an info dump, but it was important to establish what we'll be talking about from here on out. So this referendum can be summed up as achieving two things. One, recognising Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in Australia's constitution and paying respects to their 65,000 years of culture and tradition. And two, listening to Indigenous Australians through The Voice, a committee of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who can give advice to Parliament. Now, it's a bit of an understatement to say that history hasn't been kind to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people for the last 235 years or so, since the first settlers landed in Australia in 1788. Quite frankly, the framework of our political institutions, the Constitution, even played a part in this discrimination. The Constitution prohibited the counting of Indigenous peoples as citizens until the 1967 referendum, when the Australian people overwhelmingly voted yes to remove Section 127 titled Aborigines Not to be Counted in the Reckoning of the Population, and to altering Section 51 or the race power, which had prohibited the federal government from using its power to make special laws for the Aboriginal race. 
the 1967 referendum was the most successful in Australians' history, with an overall yes vote of 91.8%. Hell, even the concept of terra nullius, the belief of the first settlers when coming to Australia that the land belonged to no one, has been questioned for a while. This legal term suggested that the indigenous people inhabited an absence of civilised qualities capable of land ownership. But this is questionable in line of Bruce Pascoe's book and documentary of the same name, Dark Emu which delves into the pre-colonial practices of agriculture and engineering of an indigenous cultures in Australia. Now, all of these talking points are to illustrate that recognition has a twofold meaning. First, it's to recognise collectively the good with the bad when it comes to the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander history in this country. Books such as Dark Emu show us the rich culture before Europeans landed on Australian soil, and also to acknowledge that such painful events, such as the Stolen Generations, did happen. This brings us to the second point, that we recognise there is a path forward if we can reconcile with our past. We can break the cycle where we must recognise that for a while now, government has been setting up committees for Indigenous peoples, not with them. One of the tragedies in all this is that over the decades, many billions of dollars has been wasted on poorly informed policies. They've been designed and implemented by non-Indigenous politicians and bureaucrats in Canberra or the state capitals with little or no input from the very people they are supposed to be helping, many of them living thousands of kilometres away, often in remote communities. On the principle that Aboriginal peoples are best served when they are able to speak for themselves about their own conditions, Australia is a signatory to the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, which includes a commitment to self-determination. The voice through its grassroots representations would help to facilitate this often dishonoured commitment. From Harold Holt's Council of Aboriginal Affairs in 1967 to Gough Whitlam's 1972 National Aboriginal uh, Consultative Committee to Malcolm Fraser's National Aboriginal Conference in 1975 to Bob Hawke's Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Commission in 1989 all the way to Sorry Day under Kevin Rudd in 2008. You get the picture. The government, as a political body, has had a history of establishing commissions, bodies, representatives on behalf of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples, and another government comes in and tears it down and starts again. But this time it's different. The Uluru Statement of the Heart is a commitment to forming the framework to recognising and listening to Indigenous peoples' concerns. Now, let's get into the meat and potatoes of this framework. What is the voice to Parliament? Now, I'm a visual learner, and I found it easier to understand the framework by showing this diagram. The voice is essentially a representative advisory body which will consult all levels of Parliament on Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander uh, Islander issues. Each region, whether it is regional or urban communities will have a local voice which will target the local concerns within those communities. It is within these local voice committees that representatives will be elected from the elders, community leaders and community organisations. Representatives will have the ability to consult all levels of government by approaching what is called the partnership table. So, for example, the alcohol laws in the Northern Territory, the local voice representatives will be able to weigh in and advise the local, state or federal government as to how to handle the situation from the Indigenous perspective. 
Although I must stress, as you saw in the diagram, there is no veto power. This is non-binding binding advice, plain and simple. This brings us to the national voice, which is the one getting all the media attention. This is the advisory group who will be in Canberra working directly with the Australian government. The national voice will be working on advice concerning issues which affects all the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander mobs around the country. The National Voice will work with the local and regional voices on how best to advise government about Indigenous issues. As an example, a national approach to the Voice would tackle closing the gap issues like Koori courts do with recidivism. The matters before the Koori courts are largely violence-related, including family violence. Their purpose is to provide a therapeutic style of justice that encourages people not to re-offend. They involve the Aboriginal community, particularly suitable elders, to achieve better outcomes from the court system when offenders require more than punishment to enable them to behave in socially acceptable ways. The outstanding feature of the Koori Courts is the service given to the courts by elders. They are appointed to serve with the presiding magistrate to hear cases, counsel offenders and victims, offer advice on support services, and identify solutions beyond mere punishment to gain longer-term beneficial outcomes for perpetrators, victims and the wider community. This framework has been a slow and methodical process. Everything we have just discussed was part of the Indigenous voice co-design process, leading from the Uluru Dialogues during the period of 2015 to 2017. What are called the design principles? Here's an example. A. The voice will, be, will give independent advice to the parliament and government. The voice would make representations to the parliament and the executive government on, on matters relating to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. The voice would be able to make representations proactively. The voice would be able to respond to requests for representations from the parliament and the executive government. The voice would have its own resources to allow it to research, develop, and make representations. The parliament and executive government should seek representations in writing from the voice early in the development of proposed laws and policies. I do encourage people who haven't already to read Thomas Mayo and Kerry O'Brien's book, The Voice to Parliament Handbook. It's got a lot of succinct detail for such a short book. But now that I have explained all of that, it brings us to the question. It's simple. It asks the people of Australia to recognise the history of the past and to listen to Indigenous peoples about concerns regarding their own community. Nothing more and nothing less. A proposed law to alter the constitution to recognise the First Peoples of Australia by establishing an Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander voice. Do you approve this proposed alteration? At the end of the day, this is my two cents as to what the voice to Parliament is about. After all, it was either this video essay, voice to Parliament training, or reading the 270-page final report. All jokes aside, I hope you found it informative and that it's the start of a journey to writing a yes on your ballot paper in October 2023. If you haven't already, like, share and subscribe for more content in the future. And remember folks, to keep thinking and keep learning. Goodbye till next time.